Can you give the Lord a big praise this morning? Hallelujah. I started to say thank you, Red, but uh, I didn't know who would respond to that this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, you're with yeah. <laughs> Jeff. Okay. <laughs> oh, praise God. You know, before we dismiss the kids, I just want to say I wondered what that was on Heather's face in that picture, and then I heard White Chocolate Fountain. And I, <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. Children, thou art dismissed. Kids of all ages, sizes, preschool, nursery to the right, kids' church to the left. Thank you, Lord. I want to say something. Paula mentioned the, the, the voter guides. We have a whole bunch of them. I was going to take them to uh, minister association meetings. I took them to that prayer meeting, and they didn't really want to put them out. And I, I forgot to take them to the association meeting to give them to the other churches. So we've got 10,000 more than we need. Amen. Uh, probably 850 more than we need. But anyway, we've got a bunch of them out there. So make sure you grab one. It's just a voter guide. It just tells you what the people who are running stand for what they believe in, and that way you can make your informed decision based on the Bible. Amen? I mean, that's the way we ought to vote according to what the Bible's telling us, not what anybody else is saying. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, that's, well, if we don't, then we're going to be messing up that way probably. Yeah, you know. Hallelujah. Uh, but that was still funny. <laughs> anyway. Hallelujah. We had a couple prayer requests come in, and I want us to mention it's good to see Lois here today. You know, she was on our prayer list, and we don't know what that was about. It's good, like Paula said, it's good to have DJ back. Praise God. Amen. He's kicking high. Oh, there he is. Most of you know that William fell this week, and he broke a few ribs. Amen. So we want to lift William up. Uh, some of you know Jim and Jerry Peters. Went to church with them years ago. Apparently, uh, Jim was in some sort of an accident and with equipment or something. He was working, and uh, he's been pretty, pretty, pretty banged up from, from probably here down to here. A lot of bones broken, sternum, and he's had some laceration of the liver and some just some different things. So we want to definitely lift Jim up this morning. Are there any other prayer requests? Je uh, do I? Oh, yes, Avery. Avery's sick, yes. Any others? Yes, Beth. What's Tears' dad's first name? Oh, father-in-law. Okay. Because when you said the name, I knew that wasn't her dad's name. Okay. All right, Jerry. Yes, amen, yes. We definitely want to pray for all those who are Man, there's a lot of people out there without water and gas and all kinds of things. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's why we haven't been seeing Robin, isn't it? She's been with the kids, had the kids. And, yeah. Okay. Amen. Yes, Nola. She needs prayer. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's go to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you and thank you that 
Lord, you know every one of these requests before we ever make them. And we thank you, Lord, that even if I forget one, you're going to know exactly what needs to be prayed for from the requests that have come. And I'm sure, Lord, that there's people here who will think of someone that they should have lifted up even while I'm speaking, and they will lift them up themselves. And we believe, Lord, that you can heal all of them. You can touch them. You can give miracles. Lord, we, we don't have to accept any kind of report that says it's the end. Lord, kings have laid on beds and prophets have shot arrows, and they've gotten up. Hallelujah. We just pray, Father, that no one shoot their arrow too short, but that they go long. Lord, we believe that you can speak over these people and minister to them and that they can get up off these beds. So we pray for, for uh, Brother Darbro. We pray, Father, for uh, Kenny. And we pray, Father, for Monica. Father, these serious cases, Father, that have been brought forth today, we thank you in the name of Jesus that the enemy cannot take them out. Father, we just pray, first of all, for their salvation. I know Beth said that that, uh, that the, her request that they were saved. Uh, we pray for Monica, for her salvation, for the Spirit of God to minister to her uh, if she doesn't know you, Lord. And we just pray, Father, that, that these people would give themselves to you and that they would allow, the Spirit of God would be able to heal them and deliver them. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. We know that you're able to do it. We speak forth now in the name of Jesus to these cancers and command them to be gone in the name of Jesus. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for setting them free. We thank you for those others who are hospitalized, Nola's sister and uh, Jim Peters. We ask, Lord, that you would heal them. Raise them up, Father. We know, Lord, that they're facing also serious things, but, but, Lord, we know that you're a God who's able to cover and do miracles. And we believe, Lord, you can cover any kind of a, of a, of a disease or a sickness or an accident or whatever may be involved. And we thank you for touching them and healing them and delivering them, and we praise you for it. We pray for those who are at home, Avery and, and uh, William. We just ask that you would be with them this morning, that your healing power would minister, your grace of God would be with them. Father, we know, Lord, you love them. Above all, Father, you love them. And we believe, Lord, that you can minister to them even now. And we thank you for it, Father. We praise you for it. And, Lord, we lift up all those people who have been affected by the weather, by the bad storm that went through the east there. Father, all those people who do not have electricity or any kind of power or anything, Father, to keep them warm or living in shelters and, and uh, aren't getting the help that they need. And I know, Lord, the governments are moving and I know that they'll never move as fast as the people want, maybe even need. But I pray, Father, for them. Lord, so many people lost homes and businesses and churches and other things that were destroyed right there along the coast. And we pray, Father, that you will restore unto them. Lord, that the insurance companies will pay out quickly, that they'll be able to rebuild and do the things that they need to do. Lord, we just pray, Father, that the areas not become blighted and, and that the uh, cleanup would happen quickly. And we just thank you, Father, that you can restore what the enemy has destroyed because lord he's only broken it he hasn't destroyed it amen according to our definitions this morning hallelujah he's only broken something it can be fixed hallelujah and we just praise you for it and we give you the glory for it and we thank you father for all that you're doing with us and ministering to us in the name of jesus amen hallelujah well are you ready for some anointed preaching hallelujah praise god why don't you give the queen of the house a welcome amen hallelujah you know what that makes me, hallelujah, the joker, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. You know, when pastor asked me, he realized he had this week left, and he said, why don't you preach? And I was like, no, but a scripture came to mind. <laughs> and, um, you know, all that, I went home to my parents, and all that happened, and we turned around and went to minister's conference, and, you know, the, the gentleman opened up. It was John Kilpatrick who got to speak, and we were really blessed. And he opened up with the exact same scripture, and he went a different way. But I knew that night that God had planted this in, in my heart. And then about a week later, we were home, and I couldn't sleep. And he goes, I knew you were tossing a turn. And I said, well, I was preaching this sermon over and over and over again in my mind. So I believe this is from God, and I, I hope you'll receive it. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. And Father, though we're revisiting an old word that we may have heard many times, I pray that you so put it in our hearts that we would become doers, that we would be obedient to your word, Lord, and do what you have asked us to do. May you find us faithful to you, Lord God. And we thank you for it. Father, I pray that you flow through me. Father, I've, I've got so much I'd like to share, but Father, you know what is needful. You know what is necessary. And I ask that you just bring it forth in a way 
that each one here may receive. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, over the past weeks, we have had several different people come in and speak. And, you know, at different points, I'm hearing different things. I remember when Pastor Dan was speaking, and he, and he talked a little about, about the Eagle Scouts at one point, how they're going through turmoil, and people want them to adjust their beliefs. And Brother Dean came up and said, you know, in New York City, the schools are handing out contraceptives to girls and boys that are 14 years of age without parental consent. And I sit there, and, I, you know, one, one day the president was on the TV, and he said, he, we need to redefine marriage. And I started thinking, what is going on in our land? And we need a move of God in our land. And then I started thinking, you know, we've had drought this year. There's famines. There's rain. Too much rain at the wrong time. We've had Frankenstorm that has affected millions of people. And I said, God, what is going on? And I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles 7, because we're going to camp there. We're not going to jump around. We're going to camp there. Most of you probably already know where I'm heading. But I want to start in chapter, or with verse 12. And I've entitled this, If My People. In verse 12, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When... I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. And I hesitated. I said, God, when? When means it's going to happen. When? It's not a if. It's when. And I started to consider that. And you know, God knows our nature. And if you go back to Judges, you will find a pattern throughout Judges. In fact, you can go before, um, before Judges back to Egypt. God delivers the people out of Egypt, right? Great plagues. They see them, and yet they're protected. No harm befalls them. They get to the Red Sea. Pharaoh starts coming after them, and are they like, oh God, let's see what you can do now? No. They're like, why did you bring us out here? We're going to be killed. They get across the Red Sea. They see God marvelously part the Red Sea, and they start whining and complaining. We're going to die of starvation. We have nothing to eat. God sends manna. And they whine and complain and whine and complain. They see the miraculous hand of God, yet they forget and whine and complain. And it's no different in Judges. God sends them in. He gives them the land. They're following God. They rise up. They forget God. They follow their own ways. Pestilence comes in. Um, destruction, usually by another a neighboring enemy called like Philistines. Remember David, Goliath? Or, yeah, David's later. The Philistines come in. He raises up Samson. He raises up Deborah. People get delivered. They praise God. They worship him. They follow him. They forget God. They start walking in their own ways. They deny him. Again, they get oppressed by the enemy. They cry out. God hears. He sends a deliverer. They rise up. And it's a pattern, cycle after cycle after cycle. And perhaps in this nation, we have seen another cycle come to pass. Because we certainly are not the Christian nation that we were founded to be. Amen? And God says in verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, I'm not going to camp out too much on the last part of that because as Christians, we have been taught the promises of God. We want the blessings of God. But God says, if you follow me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, it's called sin. The wages of sin is death. Curses fall. That's the way it is. God's principles do not change. He is the God of yesterday. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He will not change his principle stand. So I want to encamp on this scripture for just a few moments. If. That is a big if. If is not guaranteed. It is a choice. It expresses a condition. It suppose that or in case that. Upon the condition that my people, it's up to you folks, 
It is your choice. And I understand busyness, but it's your choice. It is your choice. The second part, my people who are called by my name. Do you call yourself a Christian? Romans 10, 9 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. We call ourselves Christians. We are no longer of this world. We serve Christ. We are ambassadors. We're to be a light in this world. We're not to be conformed. We're to be transformed. Christians. They were first called Christians in Antioch, according to Acts eleven twenty six. 26. It comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means Christ's followers. So if we are called by his name, we are his people. And are we doing what he is asking? Will, I'm going to go through this very, every word almost. Will expresses futurity, usually with implication of intention, determination, compulsion, obligation, necessity. You know, if there's one thing I've learned is if I really want something, I will go after it. And there is nothing that will stop me. Come on. You will give up anything. You will work all night and go to the Colts game because you want it. I mean, seriously. Or the Bengals game or the Steelers game. Think of the things you give up for the things you want. Will you give up those same things for the things of God? Will you give them up to see his hand move? Are you willing to not deny what you want for his wants? and to seek him and to pray. The next part says, they will humble themselves. Humble in Hebrew is kanad. It means to bend the knee. It is positional. To bend the knee. To humiliate. When they come, and the, the closest thing we have to lordship in our memory is probably the best films of the 1400 when King Arthur times and they had lords, and they would bow. They would bow their knee. Do we bow our knee to our Lord, to our God? Humility means, from Webster, having or so, showing a consciousness of one's defects or shortcomings. Not proud or self-assertive. Low in condition or rank. It suggests an unassuming character in which there is an absence of pride and assertiveness. Now, when the gentleman talked on this, he introduced a scripture, he talked on pride, and I want to touch on that just a moment, because I believe pride is a very insidious sin that we often do not realize. Pride, by definition, is an overly high opinion of oneself, exaggerated self-esteem conceit, it refers to a justified or excessive belief in one's own worth, merit, or superiority. Pride says things like, I don't need anything or anyone. I can do it myself. I don't need God. And we have to be careful because we may be saying that without really realizing that. I've got education. I can do it myself. I don't need any help says things like, I am such a beautiful singer, which I'm not. I should be on American Idol because I can win. I know I can win. That's what pride says. It over-exaggerates itself. It thinks it's high, itself higher than it ought to. Proverbs 16, 18 said that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, 23 says a man's pride will bring him low but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Luke 18, 14 says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know what? I would rather humble myself. James 4, 10 says, humble yourselves. You humble yourself. Because let me tell you, if you don't, God will. And I don't know about you, but that's a harsh thing. King Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up in his pride. In Daniel, I believe it's in chapter 4, 
If you go back there, he got lifted up. Look at this great kingdom. And let me tell you, Babylon was a great kingdom. It was what they consider one of the first world powers at that time. Think about the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. It must have been magnificent. I was reading upon it, and it said that the walls were so high, they were just as deep into the ground so no one could turn under. It was an amazing t city for the time. And King Nebuchadnezzar lifted up, look what I have done. And God said he was going to humble them, that he would be eating grass like cows. And you know what? He did. He went out of his mind. He was eating grass like cows. It says, till his beard was long and his nails were as claws. It wasn't an overnight thing. It was a time period. And then he realized that God was God. And he was humbled. So check your spirits. Do we have any pride within us? I was not really laughing, but I was amazed at the song when Joanna first played. Who am I? That's what humility says. God, who am I that you are mindful of me? When he created us, he created us from the dirt. When we die, we go back to, we are dirt. No matter how well we dress it, no matter how well we paint it, no how, matter how well we make it smell, it is still dirt. Don't think too highly. We need him. Stay humble before God. When I heard that sermon, um, the man preached a sermon that's called Leviathan. I don't know what God has done or what God is doing, but I'm amazed to think that he sent Jesus for me so I can be his servant. What a privilege, what an honor. Who am I that the almighty God would hear me? He's got all of you, but yet he hears me. He hung the stars in the sky. He knows their name, but yet he cares about me. He loves me. What an amazing thing. He sees you as special. He calls you daughter. He calls you son. And he watches out over you. What amazing. What amazing, awesome God that he loves us so much. Do we consider? Do we consider that when he speaks, things happen, things move, and yet he watches out over me? He watches out over each one of you? What an amazing, awesome God we have. It continues. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and. Now I want to stress this and because many, many times I've heard this scripture quoted improperly. And it focuses on two things. But this word and is repeated and repeated. And and means in addition to doesn't mean or. It means and addition to. If we will humble and pray. And let me give you this. When God was showing me this, he spoke to my heart and said, if you are not humble, the rest will not happen. It starts with humility. Because if you're not humble, you have no need to ask God for help. You have no need to seek him. You have no need. Because you are self-sufficient. You are it. You know, last night I was reading, and um, I'm reading a book by Menzies on the Bible Doctrines, which is the 16 Fundamentals of Faith. And in the section in the Fall of Man, he said that um, from the beginning of time when Adam and Eve fell, they wanted to exalt themselves. Because what the devil told Eve was, you will surely not die, but God knows that you will be like him. They wanted to be like God. And I started thinking about that on my way home today. I said, why do we want to be like God? Yes, he's loving. Yes, he's powerful. But you know, one day we all stand before him. And he's going to judge the hearts of men. Who wants that responsibility? You know, I don't. Seriously, do I really want to see someone's heart in its true nature? I like to believe that everyone's warm and wonderful and loving and speaks only good things. And I don't want to be the one that says, 
depart from me. I never knew you. Would you? So why do we want to be like God? Why do we think? What is it within us that says, oh, we are so great? He is the only one that's great. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Pray means to implore, beseech, entreat, and ask for the Hebrew root palal to intercede or pray. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing but in everything. Everything. Not just the things that are important. Everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We love to quote the second half. May the peace of God guard your mind, your heart. But you see, it starts with, with everything, make your request known in prayer and supplication. Are we willing to do to open the doors of heaven? Are we willing to be obedient? James 4, 2 says, because you have not because you ask not. In, in verse 3, it says, because you ask amiss to heap it upon your own lust. Are we so self-centered that the only things we can ask for is for my form no more? Or do we really consider what is the will of God? Our nation is having an election on Tuesday. And we look around and say, what? Are we praying? Have we been obedient to pray for our leaders in office? And not that his days may be short and another take his place. <laughs> Amen. But 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 says, Therefore I exert you. Now this is Paul. First of all, that all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Have we been praying? God put the man in office. We may think we did, not me, but we may think as a nation. God's in control. And if we really believe that, are we praying? Are we praying that God would move? I mean, what if he gets saved? What a difference that would be. But have we been praying? Have we been asking? Do we care? Do we put that as a priority? Do we really pray? Do we seek God? The next words, and seek. How much time, let me ask you this, how much time in a week do you spend in prayer? How much time? I was thinking this morning, you know, Many of us have been on diets before, and one of the things they say is to write it down, what you eat throughout the day. Make yourself accountable to somebody. And I know when I did that, I wrote down. I watched what I was put in my mouth. So let me challenge you. Write down what you do during the day. Not to the second, but you know, from 6 to 6.15, I got up and I showered. At 6.15 to 6.45, I prayed. At 6, you know, whatever. And really be open and honest with yourself and see how much time you are spending with God in prayer. Because do we? I know when I get challenged with busyness, some of the first things that want to slip is my prayer and my seeking him. When do the phone calls come? When I sit down to spend time with him. You know, it's okay to turn the phone off. It's okay not to answer the door. When you're spending time with God, is that our priority? If we continue in the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now, in this little picture, I put a Bible. Because, you know, in John it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God has chosen to reveal himself to us through his word. Are we spending time in his word? Are we seeing who Jesus is? Are we seeing who we are to be like? Because if we are Christ followers, should we not become more like Christ? 
And how do we do that if we're not standing in his word? It's like we open it up and it becomes a mirror to us so we can see what we're really like. And maybe sometimes we need to repent, but maybe sometimes it's showing us what we should do. Or maybe sometimes it's just showing us greater depths of who he is. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian, you can always learn more about Christ. You know, his love, it describes that we may know the height, the width, the breadth, and the depth of his love. How many times have we had a revelation and we come back to it a year or two later and God shows us even more on the same area, on the same scripture, a deeper revelation of what he's trying to tell us. But you don't get it if you don't spend the time with him. Write it down. How much time am I spending with him? And really see, we all might be surprised at just how little time we really do spend with him, if we're honest. We want his promises. We want his blessings. God says, if you're obedient, if you follow me, blessings will follow you. Are we willing? And that's not easy. When you seek after someone, you search after them. The definition is to find, to search for, to explore, to investigate. Do we get out dictionaries and concordances and anything we can find? Commentaries, trying to learn what God's trying to speak to us through his word. Because I know there are far more people smarter than me out there that knows the word of God. But yet, how much that revelation that God gives us, you don't lose that. When God speaks to your heart, you don't lose that. That's that goal that you can hold on to, that you can change, that you can grow, that you live by. But you got to do it. You got to do it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and, again, it's not or, it's and, turn from their wicked ways. Now, some of us don't like to hear that because, quite frankly, we like our little pet sins. If they didn't cause some sort of pleasure, we wouldn't be there. Turn means to change direction. I put a U-turn to change a trend. You turn from something to something. And in this case, you turn from sin to God, to righteousness. You change the way you think about something. And don't think you can't. Jesus, when the woman was called in adultery, they brought him to, or her to him, and they said, what are we to do? The law says we're to stone her. Right? And he said, he, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And he got on the ground, he started writing, and they left one by one. And he asked her, where are they? What happened? And she says, they've gone. And he says, well, you know, and this is what Jesus said. Neither do I condemn you. Those who are pricked in the heart, they know they've got something going on. And in today's age, it is very easy to have secret sin with computer and technology. He said, neither do I condemn you. That's why he died on the cross. The blood, once and for all, the remissions of sin, it's washed away. You've got to turn. You've got to repent. Go and sin no more. It's your choice. When you weren't saved, those chains kept you down. But the atonement, the blood of Jesus, breaks those chains. You do not have to go that same route again. He empowers us so we don't have to. His blood cleanses us so we don't have to. If you do repent, ask for forgiveness, renounce it, stand up and walk on. You do not have to stay there. That's what he died for. Move on, turn from it. And let me tell you, garbage in, you've heard this, equals garbage out. When pastor came home from prayer, there's a new show on PBS called Call the Midwife, which of course I'm, you know, kind of my field. And it's set around 1930, 1940. And I said, you know, I don't know if I can watch that anymore. Because one of the main storylines was very subtle. 
but it ended up being about incest, and they justified it or explained it. And I said, what? Because of what had happened to these poor people and the trauma that they had suffered, that they kind of didn't really have the right mind. And you know, we, we do that today. Well, this person killed somebody because their, their parent was abusive and they beat them and they did this, and we justify it or play it down. But sin is sin, and we're to turn from our wicked ways and live for God. We're to be a light. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When Pastor was teaching back in September about past, present, and future, he spoke out of Job 22. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to turn there real quick because the scripture just jumped out at me. And I'm not going to try to say the guy's name. I was talking to Job. I'm going to start in 21. It says, now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive, please, instruction from his mouth. And lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty. Now we're talking about turning from wicked to God, right? If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. You will remove iniquity far from your tents. Did you catch that? You will remove iniquity far from your tents. You means me. Turn to your neighbor and say, you means me. I will remove iniquity from my house. Watching that show. Those little subtle things that we may not even realize because our hearts become cold and they're not sensitive and we become accustomed to our culture. And we say, oh, well, that's okay. No, it's not okay. We have got to be aware. We have got to line it up with God's word. This is his standard, not what the world says. This is his standard. And we need to be the people he has called us to be. And then he says, then, if all of this, it's not two things. It's not humble and pray. It is humble and pray and seek and turn. It takes effort on our part. But it's all four things. Then, at that time, that means at that time, next in order, in that case, if you do this, in that case, accordingly, I will. Affirmative. He will hear your cry. Now, he's the God. I mentioned Egypt earlier and the Israelites when they were slaves. What did he tell Moses before he sent Moses? He had heard the cry of his people. They were crying out because of the slavery. He heard them, and it moved him to action. He raised up Moses. What if he hears you and raises up a deliverer in our country? What if he hears you and he starts a great revival? The revivals I know of did not just happen by chance. They started with seasons of prayer and of intercession. If pastor called for an all-night prayer meeting for people to come to the church for an hour and pray, would you come? Would you? He's got prayer from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock during Sunday school. Were you here this morning? Would you come? I mean, last night we all got an extra hour of sleep. Well, not all of us, most of us. <laughs> I got to see the hands go crazy. This isn't my sermon, but it was kind of funny because I'm sitting there ready to chart from an incident that happened at 1.40 a.m. And I go into this brilliant computer and I type in my date, and I type in my time, and this little screen comes up. Do you mean daylight savings time? No, I don't know. You know, it's 1.40 in the morning. I really don't care, <laughs> you know? But it's actually 1.15. The time I was typing happened at 1.40, but it was actually 1.15, because at 1.59, everything went back to 1 o'clock again. And I told my friend, I said, guess what? It's 1.04 again. 
<laughs> so now we only have six more hours to go. <laughs> but the computer said, yeah, it's not overtime, believe you me. I wish it was. Anyway, the computer said, do you mean daylight savings time? And I said, no. And I meant yes. And you know, it was smart enough to tell me that it was too far in the future and I couldn't chart on that time. Why did it just do it in the first place? It knew what I meant. <laughs> you know? I'm like, seriously? So I had to go back in and do it all over again. Anyway, praise God. Were you here? Are you willing to commit to an hour? Will you do it? Will you cry out to God for this nation? When the doors are open, are we here? Are we willing to pray? It's not always easy. And it's sacrifice. Because it means I have to give up an hour of my time to do something for God. I will hear and I will forgive their sin. Back to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And he doesn't just forgive us, he forgives us. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. They are no more. We're not covered by the blood. We're washed in the blood. They're gone. It's removed. And he's faithful to do that. He will forgive us. But we've got to confess. We've got to turn. And I've talked on sin before. I don't want to stay there and camp on it. But it doesn't mean I'm sorry, God, and I go do it again. If my intent is to go keep doing the same thing, that is not repentance. Repentance is the intent to stop. I'm not saying you won't fail, but it's the intent to stop, and he'll bring you on. And it gets longer and longer and longer between until we are totally set free. For not every sin, but for some. Because he's growing us. He's developing our character. He wants us to learn. And he will heal their land. He will hear them, he will forgive, and he will heal their land. I'd like to see our land healed. I'd like to see the greatest revival of all time. The ladies Wednesday night, we were talking, and they said, you know, I believe end times are coming. And, you know, I've been hearing that, and that's great. But, you know, if we really believe that, what are we doing about it? Are we just here on Sunday mornings enjoying the presence of God? Or are we out there really trying to get those people who don't know Jesus to know him, to snatch him from the trail they're on? Do we care? If we really believe he's coming, then our time is short. We've got much work to do. Are we busy about our father's business? Or are we too busy about my business? Guys, it's time for the church to wake up. And I really want to encourage you to take it to heart. To pray, to humble. It's got to start with humility. Because honestly, the rest of the stuff, it just doesn't happen. Because... Again, we won't turn because God knows my needs. He knows I'm special, and he'll let me get by with this. No, he won't. He didn't let King David, and we're no more special than him. We're all just average. But he loves us. So I'm going to ask Joanna to come back to the stage, and we're going to play a song. And I'm going to give you an opportunity, folks, to come and to cry out to God. I'll ask, um, before we do that, you know those voter guides? We have 900 of them. Take a handful. Put them out in your communities. Just pass them door to door. It's not Republican, it's not Democratic, it just shows them where they stood on their positions on different matters. Put them in people's hands so they are informed. I believe you can take them into, can you take them into the voting? Because they're not just for a person. And it's for the entire state of Indiana. It shows senators running from the whole state. Those running for House of Representatives, it shows the different regions. Take them out and do something with them. Take them to work. Put them wherever you can so people can have some information. Because what we hear on TV, the ads, you know, who knows where people really stand? 
because they always make themselves look good. So I encourage you to take those when you leave. But I'd like you to all stand. We're just going to take a few moments. You know, maybe there's a part that struck you. If it's repentance, then come repent. If it's just seeking him, come and seek him. Maybe it's just praying and asking God for a great revival upon this land. Or maybe it's humility. Maybe we need to humble ourselves once again before God. And I'm going to encourage you to come to this altar and fill in and pray. To seek God and see what he will do. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead. Thank you, Jesus.
what a timely message considering our elections coming up. Amen. Yeah, I think she was supposed to win today. Thank you, Lord. We struggled with that a little bit, went back and forth on it, thought maybe Paula should get up and preach because she didn't actually preach. She, she prayed God would show up so she wouldn't have to. Jason tried that, didn't quite work. <laughs> you know, I, I got away this past week, spent some time in prayer, and Cheryl would call, you know, we'd talk, and she goes, what's the Lord, is the Lord showing you something? I'm like, <sighs> you know, it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of frustrating sometimes to, to uh, seek God's face. Well, if he showed me what he wanted to show me on the first day, I wouldn't have been doing it on the second and the third. Amen. You know, by the whole th- time the whole thing was over, I came away with things. And uh, one, of, one of the things that the Lord kept, I mean, he just kept coming back was focus. And, and he'd been dealing with me already about a lot of personal stuff. I'd say 90% of what I got was more personal than it was corporate. It was more about my attitude than it was about actions as far as new programs for the church and all kinds of stuff like that. You know, that's what I was wanting. But he had, to, he had to straighten me out first. But one of the things he kept bringing back to me was focus, focus, focus. And so I, I made an anagram, you know, I focus, okay? There's areas I know we need to, you know, fellowship and outreach. And I come up with stuff that I might share down the road, you know, that kind of I felt like had, to, you know, areas in our church that we needed to work on or do. And, uh, but I just felt like focus, need to focus. So I get back to the church, you know, on Thursday, and I'm sitting around there. I'm trying to process a lot of the stuff I was, you know, all hearing and all that. And I don't know if you remember Pastor Danny preached uh, a while back, and he gave us all those blocks of wood. And uh, mine was sitting on, the, on, my, te- on, my, uh, on my desk there, and I hadn't, I hadn't paid any attention to it. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, I just, it's been there and part of the furniture. I wasn't even paying attention to it. And I look at it while I'm sitting there, and it says, focus. <laughs> uh, I'm like, okay, maybe I did hear. Yeah. I think i already been given that, maybe. I had notes with me from 2003, and I got to looking through them, and, and what I kept seeing there was that there was a lot of stuff I still hadn't done that I ought to do. And uh, a lot of it had to do with me getting, you know, getting with God and seeking his face about some stuff. So... I, uh, I feel like it was a timely message for me. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to close. Oh, yeah, we're going to close. Amen. Father, we just praise you. We thank you. Lord God, we give you the glory that you're able to do great things in our lives. And I thank you, Father, that, that you minister to us this week as we seek your face. Lord, as we humble ourselves, as we pray, seek your face. Lord, I thank you that you're going to heal our land. And we pray, even as we've already prayed for this great country of ours, Lord, that the people would hear your voice and vote accordingly. That this this election go towards the things of God, towards the Bible, towards those things that we truly say we believe in. Lord, let us not shirk our duty. If we're registered, Lord, let us be there and do our duty. Let us not forget about it. Let us go and do what we need to. And we just thank you for helping us to do so. And we give you the praise, Father. Let us be your people this week, the people who are called by your name. And let us act like.